A private pilot sees nine UFOs and coins the term flying saucer. Kind of. Well, that's what we're talking about today. Welcome to Old Fashioned UFOs. Shane Hurd here. Today, Jason McClellan and I are having a casual discussion about the June 1947 Kenneth Arnold sighting and the birth of the term flying saucer. We'll talk more about that next. Just like a cocktail classic such as the Old Fashioned endures the test of time, so too do the classic Old Fashioned UFO cases. Whether it be photographic evidence, the physical evidence, the strength of eyewitness testimony, or government documentation, these cases are worthy of their classic status and deserve our attention. So sit back with your beverage of choice and follow along as we discuss our favorite subject, UFOs. How you doing today, Jason, and what you drinking? Man, I am good, Mr. Hurd. Thank you for asking. And, you know, of course I'm drinking an old-fashioned because that's what we do on this show. But I'm taking my <laughs> inspiration from you, good sir, from our last episode. And I had to go out and get some of the Four Roses Single Barrel. So oh. mine is made with Four Roses Single Barrel, and it is delicious. How good about choice. You? What are you drinking? Well... I'm pretty lame tonight, so I figured instead of the four roses and, and you know, straight up, I was thinking of, of a kindler, gentler drink tonight, so I was just going to go bourbon and Coke. So I go to the fridge and, you know, I, I get my bourbon, my ice, and get ready to pour the Coke, and I realize no Coke, but Aww. there's Dr. Pepper. <laughs> so I'm drinking that classic <laughs> bourbon and Dr. Pepper. I guess classic when you're a teenager and that's all you got. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Dr. Pepper's a better choice. So good job, dude. Yeah, it works. Oh, what, what's the old saying? <laughs> Liquor is quicker. <laughs> cheers. <laughs> all right. Well, now that we're all settled in with a good drink, let's talk UFOs. Let me start off with a summary of the June 24th, 1947 Kenneth Arnold case. So, at around 3 p.m. on June 24th, 1947, businessman and pilot Kenneth Arnold was flying his Call Air A2 airplane from Chehalis, Washington to Yakima, Washington. Uh, he had made a slight detour to take a quick look for a downed military aircraft in the vicinity of 14,400 foot Mount Rainier. And the flying conditions were perfect. So he not only wanted to do his civic duty, but there was a reward for its discovery. So since the conditions were good, uh, he was in the area and he had the time. He was actively scanning the area for this downed plane. And as he was doing so, uh, he noticed a bright flash that lit up even the entire cockpit of his airplane. Uh, he scanned to find out what caused that flash of light, and he saw in the distance nine flying objects in a formation in the not too far distance. Uh, this immediately caught his attention, and he trained his eyes on these objects to determine what they could be. He first thought airplanes, of course, but he noticed they were moving much faster than anything else he had seen fly. And there were no wings, struts, vertical tail, not even a fuselage. And they did not look like a rocket or missile either. So although he was stunned by what he saw, he had the presence of mind to measure their speed by watching his flight clock, timing the trajectory of these aircrafts between Mount Rainier and Mount Adams, which was a known distance of about 50 miles. So it took 102 seconds for them to travel that 50 miles, resulting in a speed of about 1,700 miles an hour, which at the time was about 1,000 miles an hour faster than any known aircraft of the day. Well, once he landed at the airport, he reported what he saw, and soon his experience would become what today is considered the beginning of the modern UFO mystery. Now, while this is just an extremely brief summary of the case, there's so much to unpack. Uh, not only about the sighting itself, but about, um, you know, the reaction of the press, the public, the military, all the things, you know, so associated with UFOs. 
And as with any investigation, a case must include witness testimony. And this requires an estimation of the credibility of that witness. So Jason, what do we know about the man himself, Kenneth Arnold? Yeah, right. So from what we know, Kenneth Arnold most definitely has the makings of a credible witness. I mean, first, he was a successful businessman. So successful that he owned his own plane, obviously, and had his own landing strip on his ranch in Idaho. He was a successful businessman, but he was also reportedly respected in business. Second, he was a pilot, and pilots are largely considered among the most credible of observers when it comes to UFOs, because they spend a lot of time in the sky, certainly more than we do, and they are obviously more accustomed to seeing things in the sky than we are. An important part of what they do in the sky is observe. They have to be aware of their surroundings. They also have specialized skills and technical knowledge. So when it comes to calculating things like distance and speed, pilots are typically better equipped than most people. So when he spoke with reporters the day after the incident, he came across as credible and reliable because the details he provided gave the impression that he was a careful observer and he didn't appear to exaggerate or sensationalize the story. So as far as witnesses go, Kenneth Arnold was largely viewed by the media, the military, and the public as credible. And he provided a compelling account of what he observed. And because we've established that he was a pilot, here's a little fun fact. Kenneth Arnold took his first flying lesson in Minot, North Dakota. He actually went to grade school and high school there too. And Minot is a familiar place to UFO researchers. There have been several notable UFO encounters in Minot and the surrounding areas in North Dakota over the years, including an incident in the 60s where a UFO shut down ICBMs at Minot Air Force Base. And just over in Fargo, George Gorman, a military pilot, found himself in a dogfight of sorts with a UFO in 1948. So that's some fun trivia for you. Yeah, it is. And I mean, I think it's uncanny how often there are these little synchronicities between different UFO cases and sightings, you know. And I, I think that's just kind of an interesting one. I mean, sure, it doesn't mean anything per se, other than it's just ironic that then in the 60s, you know, this happened in, in the area that he grew up in. So, yeah, that, that is a fun fact. It is, and it's fun, you know, the more you dig into UFOs and the history, you'll find all sorts of connections like this. It's fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think what's interesting, too, about, you know, the case, obviously, the, the UFOs themselves, I mean, that's incredibly interesting, but I'm, I'm one of those guys, I like the political science of ufology and, you know, the reactions of people. I always say UFOs is really about people, not not just about a, the craft or whatever. Yeah, certainly. And um, I think the press reaction is one of the things that interested me in it. And you can see how we can look back on history and just see how this thing is just kind of unfolded. Um, the press reaction to Kenneth Arnold's report is really was astonishing because the entire nation, in fact, even other nations went wild for the story. Uh, the first interview was by a guy named Bill Beckett. And he's a reporter for the East Oregonian in Pendleton, Oregon. It was only a five-minute interview. Uh, since the paper was about to go to press um, for the day, uh, Bill interviewed Kenneth in this little tiny office, and he got a few facts, and, and he rushed a small story that was kind of at the bottom of the front page of Kenneth's account. And then he also put a quick little small story on the newswire, uh, which turned out to be the match that lit the fire. A request for more information came from across the country, Canada, and even other nations. And you'd have to say that story was kind of the equivalent of going viral today, you know, in, in that day. So um, Bill conducted then additional interviews with Arnold of several hours in which more information and details were recounted. And the story is picked up by many uh, media outlets, including major national newspapers and magazines, which were real popular in the day. And um, overnight, Kenneth Arnold and his nine flying objects became one of the biggest stories of the day. Yeah, probably not something he expected. <laughs> it's certainly not, it's probably not something he uh, thought would ever become associated with him or his name. But you're right. I mean, almost seemingly overnight, um, this story spread and 
kind of think back to when this happened, a time before social media, um, a time really before television. So, you know, newspapers were breaking this story yeah. and really kind of set off that, uh, that nice flying saucer wave that was, uh, was taking place at that time across the country. Yeah, what was the one before it? Just a couple days in Washington also. Um, Maury Island. Yeah. And then, you know, Kenneth Arnold. And then one that we're going to talk about next week. And then, of course, the Biggie Roswell. So, man, that, that would have been an exciting time to be, you know, alive and kind of connected to, to UFOs. That was that was big. Exciting, yes. Well, one of the most interesting. Possibly kind of terrifying, too, right? Because it was a new thing. And people didn't know what to make of it and news traveled slower than it does now you don't have the the instant news uh, of twitter you don't have the ability to look up stories or information on the internet so you know you're just relying on the newspaper and so you'd wait wait for tomorrow's newspaper to find out if anybody had any new answers about the ufos and you know course we'll talk about in in later episodes and certainly when we get to roswell and the pressure that all of this put on the military and the government to come mm -hmm. up with answers because people didn't know what to think they just were reading about these ufo sightings that were happening all over yeah in fact at the time they really didn't even have a proper name for it i mean it was that new they didn't know what to even exactly. call it and i think one of the most interesting aspects of the kenneth arnold sighting is it's generally accepted as the case that the term flying saucer was coined. Yeah. And just, you know, explain to us how that happened, because it's kind of a, <laughs> it's, it's a convoluted mess, but we know that is the point that it happened. It really is a bit convoluted. Um, so some people incorrectly credit Kenneth Arnold himself as the originator of the term flying saucer. And... Many people also incorrectly credit the reporter, Bill Beckett from the East Oregonian newspaper as the one who coined the term. But when you look back at the stories, none of Bill's stories actually contain that term. It wasn't really until the story was picked up by the Associated Press that the term flying disc was introduced. Then finally, um, June 30th, I believe, another AP story added flying saucer. So just to clarify, Kenneth mm -hmm. Arnold never said he saw flying saucers or flying disks. What he did do was describe the motion and behavior of the aerial objects he observed. Mm -hmm. He actually described the, the movement of objects many different ways over the years, from they flew erratic like a saucer you skip across water to shiny flat objects with a peculiar weaving motion. And the way he described this weaving motion is fun too like the tail of a Chinese kite, or even a flish, fish flipping in the sun. You know, he was very good with descriptive terms to uh, you know, help people visualize what he had seen. And adding to the description of the behavior of these UFOs, Arnold described that the objects were grouped together in a diagonally stepped down echelon formation, stretched over a distance of five mm -hmm. miles. And he said they were mo moving mostly on a level horizontal plane, and the UFOs weave from side to side, darting uh, through the valleys and in between uh, nearby hills. And they would also occasionally sort of bank on their sides at the same time and causing this bright mirror-like flash of light that was blinding. But again, he never said the UFOs he saw were saucer-shaped, which is interesting. What he did say with regard yeah. to shape was that he saw a series of objects with convex shapes. He said one might have been uh, crescent-shaped, but his best description said they looked something like a pie plate that was cut in half with a convex triangle in the rear. I think there was even at least one story about this incident mm -hmm. that referred to the object as flying pie pans. That's my favorite. Uh, if you've ever seen a drawing of what <laughs> Arnold said he saw, these things look more like birds than they do a typical flying saucer. But of course, birds don't fly at 1,200 miles per hour, typically. And Arnold noted that despite this supersonic speed, there was no sonic boom. And, you know, he found that detail particularly curious. It made no sense to him that objects moving significantly faster than the 750 mile per hour sound barrier didn't generate a sonic boom. 
He figured he must be seeing some sort of secret military aircraft being tested um, using some advanced technology. Yeah, I mean, wow. I mean, that that's actually a lot of detail. Um, and, you know, interviewing witnesses, that, that's, um, you know, that's a good sign that, you know, people, you know, were good observers and they had an actual experience. And, and the fact that he used these little illustrate kind of folksy illustrations about their behavior and motion. I, I mean, again, you think about the time, right? And people, you know, didn't have a lot of high tech uh, examples to to go to it was you know more of those those folksy kind of things but yeah. you know it's it's great information and then um yeah i always even think I'm, I'm imagining in my mind that photo of him standing there in front of a placard of some sort where he's made a pretty nice illustration of him and to me it almost looks like one of the bat bat planes you know yes. from the batman movies you yes, know this total sort of this arc and then yeah some, that's you know that's certainly more yeah, a better description like, and something we would use today uh you know to describe it um <laughs> yeah. imagine if imagine if flying <laughs> pie pans had caught down instead of flying saucer i mean that would be pretty funny i can't imagine that we yeah <laughs> so, we're so accustomed to flying saucer now but it could have been flying pie pan yeah Oh yeah, that, that's hilarious. But I mean, really, yeah. no, no, no more hilarious than saucer. But we're just used to it. <laughs> we're just used to it. Yeah, exactly. It's cool. a stupid term. It's really stupid. But I love it. I mean, we're used to it. We've we've, we've grown up with it. Uh, we're used yeah. to it. But you know, like I said, he, he thought this yeah. was secret military technology or something. Um, and this is a startling sighting that was reported by a credible witness that was deemed to be credible. And of course, this all caught the attention of the military. So do you want to talk a little bit about that uh, military attention, Shane? Yeah, yeah, I think that's incredibly interesting, too. This is really kind of the start of it all, our modern UFO era and how how the you know military is, was reacting. And and we have to kind of have our head in the space that they they this was new to them too apparently and uh it's kind of interesting to see their reaction and i think it's a yeah. fascinating look into the development of of their responses to ufos starting at that time and we know there was project sign that that started right out of the gate 1947 there uh then project grudge and then eventually uh project blue book where it outlines really the evolution of the government's response um, to reports such as Kenneth Arnold. So it went from sign to grudge and then blue book. You know, it, it just kind of, they have a different tone to them um, and you can kind of see their thinking change. But um, there's a really great book written, uh, written by Bruce Maccabee and it, it's called uh, Three Minutes in June, referring to the, this case. And on pages 58 and 59, I'd like to just kind of read from it uh, sure. And he, he summarizes their response, which to me is just a great summary of how the de the Air Force had developed their their new policy, really, to, to react into UFOs. So on page 58, it says, um, The Air Force Intelligence established Project Sign and secretly investigated the saucer reports that started in the summer of 1947 and continued through the summer of 1948. The technical intelligence analyst of Project Sign treated all of the sightings, including Arnold, seriously. This was at least in part a result of the fact that a number of Air Force pilots also reported seeing flying saucers. And I, I didn't really know that. Arnold's sighting was included as unexplained in the top secret intelligence memorandum compiled by Air Force intelligence at the Pentagon during the fall of 1948. However, in the early fall of 1948, General Hoyt Vandenberg, Chief of Staff of the Air Force, rejected the conclusion arrived at by technical intelligence analysts at Wright Field, which was is now Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. They had written a secret document called The Estimate of the Situation, wherein they estimated that the saucers were interplanetary vehicles. The analysts, who were the knowledge experts in analyzing foreign aerodynamic vehicles then visited the general to argue their case but he told them something like this sorry wrong answer by rejecting the estimate in spite of the evidence vandenberg effectively established 
and Air Force policy that the interplanetary hypothesis was not to be considered as an acceptable explanation for any sighting. Other alternatives they considered was that the Russians had made immense improvements on German aircraft developed during World War II and were flying their new aircraft over the United States. However, intelligence analysts didn't believe this either. Therefore, they were forced to come up with some conventional explanation for each sighting, even if there was no logical conventional explanation. This urge to explain biased the sighting analyses done during the projects that followed sign, namely Grudge and, and Blue Book. So I think that's just powerful. I mean, that, yeah. that summary is great, and it really does show how that thinking was established. So I know we all kind of, in ufology, we think about the 1953 Robertson panel and kind of their, their uh, strategy to poo-poo um, UFO reports in the public by, you know, ridicule and so forth. But really, it had already begun uh, in, in the Air Force reaction to, to explain this stuff away, which is really sad, I think. I think it's just terribly sad because imagine, had it been taken serious then, how much further we might be along today in understanding uh, this phenomenon. Now, um, the first investigation of Arnold's claims came actually from the Air Force, Lieutenant Frank Brown and Captain William Davidson of the Hamilton Field in California. And they had interviewed him on July 12th. And this is what they said about him, going back to what you were saying about his credibility. It is the present opinion of the interviewer that Mr. Arnold actually saw what he stated he saw. It's difficult to believe the man of his character and apparent integrity would state that he saw objects and write up a report to the extent that he did if he did not see them. Well, despite that, the Army Air Force's formal public conclusion was that Arnold had seen, get this, a mirage. <laughs> a mirage. So this was a first investigated by the Army Air Corps since the Air Force hadn't been created, and it was later investigated again by Project Blue Book and Dr. J. Allen Hynek. And so you can already see the information, or the formation rather, of the strategy to dismiss these cases, and it is too bad. And, and you know, we have all of these great cases over the last 70 years and, and great evidence and a lot of it was just either hoarded or ignored or whatever. And it's just so sad. It is sad. And, you know, this is something we think about a lot, you know, because of the military's various efforts and their various policies um, and, and the government in general to, to ridicule the subject. Um, especially around that time, around the the, the mid '50s, uh, you wonder just how many how many sightings, how many incredible encounters went unreported because who would bother to report a UFO sighting during that time when all these active efforts were underway to to ridicule anybody uh, having anything to do with UFOs? So you have to imagine that there were so many incredible sightings and encounters during, you know, the past 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, 70 years that haven't been reported, that no one knows about, that have never been looked into, that have never been shared with anybody else because of the ridicule factor that was put in place so hard back then. Um, just so much lost data, so yeah. much lost usefulness. And like you said, I mean, that set us back so far. I mean, who knows if there will ever be yeah. any answers to the UFO mystery, but you have to believe that we would certainly be farther along or at least have more information to work with had that not been the case. Yeah, totally agree. And I, even, you know, as an investigator now, you know, Yes, the, the end game would be, can we truly identify, you know, who this is and why they're doing it? But, you know, that isn't all there is to it. The, the, the data and the investigation and, you know, the knowledge and the information that comes from all of those cases is, is still super valuable. And, you know, there's value in the journey, not, not just the destination, you know. And it is. It's just a sad loss. But, you know, what is 
really I did not know about this case. And as we were preparing for this, I discovered that there were other witnesses to this, not just Kenneth Arnold. What did you find out about that? Yeah, and that's that's so powerful, right? I mean, you mentioned the the power of witness testimony when it comes to UFO cases, and we just talked about you know the millions of of sightings that that uh, probably have gone unreported, and think about you know single witness UFO cases most certainly have lots of other witnesses as well that go unreported. So think about the credibility that would be lent to cases if other people would report them as well. And with the Kenneth Arnold case, that is certainly what we have here. I mean, we talked about the fact that Kenneth Arnold is considered to be a quality witness, and the credibility mm -hmm. or weightiness of this case is enhanced by so much corroboration. Um, Fred Johnson, a prospector who was on Mount Adams at the time, informed the Army Air Force that he saw six UFOs at about the same time as Arnold's sighting. He said he even observed these UFOs through a small telescope. I don't know why a prospector needs a small telescope, but that's wow. rad. I'm glad he had one. That, that helped. <laughs> uh, yeah, he cool. described these objects as round and tapered, sharply to a point in the head and in an oval shape. Another interesting detail he provided was that the UFO seemingly affected his compass. Interesting. So the Army mm. Air Force mm -hmm. reportedly found this witness to be credible. Mark up another one. Okay. Mm. So then uh, Lawrence Bernier added some useful information about the speed of the objects. He claimed he saw three of the UFOs flying over Richland, Washington, toward Mount Rainier approximately a half hour before Arnold sighting. And he said these three objects seemed to be flying edge to edge, and he assumed they were part of a larger formation. Um, he explained that he had, quote, seen a P-38 appear seemingly on one horizon and then gone to the opposite horizon in no time at all. But these disks certainly were traveling faster than any P-38, end quote. And just for reference, the max speed of a P-38 was reportedly approximately 440 miles per hour. Another witness, Ethel Wheelhouse, mm. reported that she saw several extremely fast flying disks over Yakima, Washington, around the same time as Arnold's sighting. Yakima is approximately 60 miles to the northwest of Richland. Sidney Gallagher is a witness who reported seeing nine shiny disks. A forest ranger with the Washington State Forest Service, who was on fire watch at a tower in Diamond Gap, approximately 20 miles south of Yakima, reported seeing flashes of light in a straight line over Mount Rainier at the same time of Arnold's sighting. There were at least 16 other reported UFO sightings in Washington State on the day of Kenneth Arnold's sighting. So 16 different people from 16 different positions saw the same mirage. <laughs> Isn't that magic? That's a magic mirage, right? I mean, give me a break. So, <laughs> I, I appreciate yeah. Bruce McAbee's <laughs> thoughts on why he would go back to an old-fashioned case like this to reinvestigate when we've had so many other cases since then. But first, he thought that even with the study of cases in the 50 years since Arnold sighting, we're no closer to finding answers. So maybe there is something missed by the original investigators that we might be able to resolve with new technology and more experience. Second, he feels the case, um, Arnold in particular, has five strong attributes. Witness credibility, Arnold was in the exact right place, he was there at the exact right time, he had the right attitude and skills, and he was alert and inquisitive. History does seem to show that Arnold was indeed the right person in the right place at the right time. Wow, that's stunning. I had no idea, 16 different witnesses. Wow. You don't hear that reported much. You kind of got to dig deep to find that. That's amazing. You know, I grew up, not grew up entirely, but spent four or five years when I was a little kid in Pasco, Washington. Yeah. And um, uh, I was maybe four, three, four, five, something. I have, those are among my earliest memories as a little kid. And there, the Columbia River runs right through it. And then, of course, what's there and what's kind of a big deal is the Hanford nuclear power plant. Mm. And the Hanford plant is the plant that processed the plutonium for the original A-bomb uh, in 1945. Yeah. And uh, I even remember my dad was a truck driver and he would take me with him and he was hauling uranium 
in a mine from a mine uh, from one place to, to Hanford and I would ride along with him so <laughs> and then again just talk about that little bit of weird weirdness and synchronicity you know we're talking a nuclear facility again technically associated with UFOs I mean that I just I, those connections just blow me away so man that that is some interesting stuff Jason thanks for that yeah very cool well, very cool yeah, I think this is just an awesome case. I mean, it's a real gem of a classic case. Uh, it's got so much good information. And, you know, we've got two of the three fundamental uh, pillars of an investigation. You have, you know, eyewitness testimony. You hope to get physical evidence, which we don't necessarily have here, but corroborative evidence. And, you know, that's, that's almost a mass sighting when you think about it, 16 disparate witnesses people that didn't know each other were in different locations i mean yeah. wow that blows me away yeah i think that's pretty powerful uh evidence and um but once the information of arnold's sighting became public you know that made it uh known enough that these other witnesses were able to come forward so that's a big deal um you know, today it's it's actually we have information overload, right? You've got you know YouTube and Facebook and everything, and somebody can have a sighting, they can film it and post it in thirty seconds, and boom, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people within a short period period of time can see it. So um, it's it's kind of almost overwhelming now. But back then, you know, to finally gather and assemble those sixteen witnesses and get them interviewed and stuff, it probably took months or a year or something. I don't know, but. Uh, it's a little bit different today, but still fascinating. And they, they really did do good work back then. I mean, the Air Force, there was a good investigation in, in the media as well. And, you know, because of that, we, we've got this story today and we've got a lot of information available to us. Right. Yeah. It's an extremely valuable case. I love this case. Yeah. Well, uh, I think this old-fashioned UFO case is among the best, actually. And I love it is the origin of that wonderfully mysterious, fun term, flying saucer. And it really did kick off the modern uh, UFO mystery and the human reaction to it. And that's what Absolutely. I love. I mean, those, those two elements alone make this a hugely important case. Um, you know, for, coming, yeah. from your viewpoint, you know, as a field investigator, it's got so many great things to look at here with all this witness testimony and the credibility of Arnold himself and the calculations he was able to make based on his training and experience. Um, so much there, but yeah, going back to origins of terms like flying saucer, um, this case is just, it will always be a very important part of UFO history. Yeah, well said. Well, that concludes our discussion of the old-fashioned UFO case of the 1947 Kenneth Arnold sighting. Now, next time on Old Fashioned UFOs, we're, we'll be discussing a little-known case, and one that occurred a few days after the Arnold sighting, right here in our own backyard in Cape Creek, Arizona. I'm stoked about this one. So, join us with your favorite beverage and hear about the William Rhodes case, which even has pictures, pictures that made it in the newspaper, and they have never been debunked. So Google it, friends. Well, that's it. Next time, we'll see you, and uh, as always, cheers. Cheers.